All righty. Well, let's do a quick round of introductions. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the co-facilitators for Core Investments, and I'm joined by my colleague and fellow Nicole. Hello, everybody. Good to see you and uh, see some of you multiple times today. And we have um, Alex from the Human Services Department, who some of you may have met during the um, applicants conference and uh, reviewer trainings. Alex, you yes. wanna say a quick hello? Hi everybody, nice to uh, meet you or see you again. Great, thanks. And Stacy, you are with us for a, another round. I am. Do you want me to say who I'm with this time? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'm an independent consultant helping with the grant applications and for the medium tier, I believe, I'm representing Live Oak Cradle to Career, County Park Friends, and Santa Cruz Community Ventures Seeds Program. Wow. Okay, yes. Great. I have a very busy January ahead of me. You do. You can see that. No rest for the weary. And Kyla, can you say a quick hello? Yes, we got, two, we got two of you. We got two. Do you want to? Um... <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Kayla Kumar. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the development director of an organization called Food What. Um, I'm joined actually with my colleague. Um, do you just want to? <laughs> uh, Paco. Hi everyone, my Paco. name is Francisco Strada. You can call me Paco. I just recently joined Food What. I'll, I'll be the new Kayla. And I'm okay, uh, very great. excited to uh, uh, be working on this process and uh, submitting something hopefully very meaningful for, for the organization and the community. Fantastic. Thanks, Paco. And Kayla, I'm sorry I called you Kyla. <laughs> it's close enough. <laughs> I have a Kyla in my life, and so I defaulted. Okay, so, and then we have uh, Vanessa. Uh, hi, everyone, I'm Vanessa McCroskey. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the grant coordinator for Santa Cruz City Schools. Great, nice to meet you, thanks nice for joining. And Sandy, I wonder if you've had a chance to have some lunch and wanna say hi? Yep, just finishing two in here. I had another meeting in the morning. Um, Sandy Davy from the Santa Cruz Toddler Center. And um, I guess I'm the director. I'm a project manager. I'm the tech person. And now I'm also the development person because that's um, when a small organization, um, I'm everything. And so I'm incredibly busy and certainly, uh, you know, the impact of COVID on my responsibilities, they were, they were pretty high before and they've really increased. So, um, yeah, I, I think I'm seeing, seeing a lot of nodding around, around our Zoom room here. So very familiar experience. So thanks for sharing. So we, um, we are able to offer um, today's session in English or Spanish. So you would pick the, is that right, Nicole? We're gonna do the live trans, the live interpretation today for this session as well. Hold on, let me just, I'm chatting with Stella, so let me just okay. confirm that. So one, one hour, Stella's been doing this all morning, so we were possibly gonna give her a break and then re-record -re in Spanish later, but is there anyone who would prefer to listen in Spanish? Okay, so we'll, we'll let Stella decide. Okay, so I think if, uh, if no one's wanting the simultaneous interpretation during the live session, we'll have Stella log off and we'll re-record it later in Spanish. Sounds like a plan. Okay, thanks Stella. Okay. So ignore the uh, interpretation globe, but that's how you do that and for future reference. Click on that and you could listen in Spanish. Um, our 
For those of you who haven't participated in our core coffee chats or trainings, we try to make that a standard practice and Stella does a fantastic job doing the live interpretation as well as translating slides and handouts and other materials into Spanish and trying to make it for both the RFP process and all of our other uh, training and TA offerings as accessible as possible. So we will re-record this in Spanish. And if you know of anybody who would like to listen in English or Spanish who couldn't attend live today, we'll make these recordings available. So we're here to discuss the medium or large tier for the uh, core RFP, the core request for proposals. And so I'm wondering how many of you have had a chance to look at that application online or downloaded it perhaps, or maybe even set up a reviewer account. Vanessa, you have? Okay. Um, Stacy, I know you have. So we, and we have um, a Google Doc that we have been collect using to collect your questions and some of which we'll have to forward to the human services department. Um, and one of those just right out of the gate, um, since Alex is here with us and she's our reviewer guru, um, Stacy had some trouble this morning trying to set up and then re-log in to her reviewer account. So I'm gonna give her a chance to pose that question to Alex while we're all here together in case others have had that issue. But meanwhile, if you will um, look at the Google Doc uh, link that Nicole's about to put in the chat, we can collect your questions and start chipping away at them as best we can. Stacy, go ahead and pose your question to Alex. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex, I set up my account this morning and then went to log into my account. When I went back to the page, it had saved my login information on sort of the built-in portal, but it still had that white pop-up um, screen on top of it, the, the square that asked for the login information. Um, I X'd out of that and just hit, you know, log in and it, it brought back the white box. So I tried to log in through the white box and it just brought the empty white box back. So I haven't actually been able to get into the portal yet. Um, I never received a confirmation email of setting up my account. I don't know if that was a, there was a glitch and I should have, and then you activate. Um, I didn't get anything after setting up the email. Yeah, that's super bizarre. Um, okay. and I'm sure frustrating too. Um, and I don't off the bat don't have really any idea as to why it might have happened that way. Um, I think uh, potentially going through and trying to create a new account and seeing like if you do get that confirmation email that an account has been created could be helpful. Um, I can reach out to reviewer um, if you want to send um, your like login information that you did create. We can reach out to reviewer together um, and uh, okay. see if they have any suggestions. Did when because I I went through the portal webinar that you did, and so I know you have an account that you've played with extensively. When you set up your account, did you get some kind of confirmation email? But that's a good question. I don't I don't remember. How about uh, others? Has anyone else successfully logged into reviewer and logged back out and back in? Just haven't tried it yet or okay. Okay. I'll, um, I'm, I've logged in and out. I'll search my email right now and see if I got a, a confirmation. Oh thanks, uh, Vanessa. Yeah. That's great. And Alex, I'll send you my login information too. And yeah, that's a good maybe um Maybe I can try logging in and, and see if it works through my system. Okay, all right. So as Alex said in her training, um, this is new for this process, new to the county, new to the reviewers, new to the applicants. And while we always hope for a glitch-free process, um, it's rare and maybe impossible. So we're sorry that you're experiencing glitches, but glad that they're happening early when there's opportunities to fix them. So a, a reminder, a good reminder to everybody that um, the sooner the better to try to set this kind of stuff up and see if you are able to work with it um, so that you're not doing that at a stressful time, like when you're trying to hit the send button before the deadline. <laughs> so, um, so I encourage everybody to try that too. And then um, just a, a, a note um, in general about proposal preparation. Um, I know many of you are experienced at doing that, but um, the 
the county has made Word versions of the applications available, and those might be easier to maneuver and share and, and work on than in that in the portal itself where you have to go, you know, one page at a time and you have to complete things before you can move on and you, only one account can be logged in at a time and all those kinds of constraints. So um, and Vanessa's saying she doesn't think she got a confirmation email. So that might not be the, the sticking point. Um, so can I just add to Nicole, yeah, I was just looking through my email to, I couldn't remember either if I gotten a confirmation and I don't think I did either. Mm -hmm. And then I do know that like when I go back to log into my reviewer account, there's like a login page for the core application. And it's different from like if you just Googled reviewer and end up on their, because I did that the first time where I was trying to log in on their company page. <laughs> and it wasn't the, because there's like a login button there. So I don't know, to my, there's like two different web issue two different URLs that you have to... I was on the make sure you're on one right that one. shows how many, like the countdown of how many days are left till the proposal's due. That was the page I was on, like a circle. Yeah. Oh, that sounds I, like the right one. Yeah, I do think you were on the right one and I'm having the same type of issue when I try to log in with your, your account info. So um, I will start a reviewer ticket to see if they can fix the issue because it's definitely on their side. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Okay, great. So one question down <laughs> and one potential solution in the wings. So um, in the Google Doc that Nicole put a link to, you can add some questions there um, and we will try and sort through them or just feel free to pose them. We'll try and capture them as we go along or put them in the chat, whatever works for you. So what, what questions do you have about the the medium and large tier. Go ahead. All right. Um, sorry, I couldn't figure out the the Google Doc. I'll just jump in. Yeah, jump we have in. a few questions on our end, and and I apologize. I I briefly skimmed the um, the answers that were posted on the web page today. Thank you so much for putting those on there. And it's I, I want to just kind of double check one of them and specifically we're trying to understand um um there's you know one application that will be sent to both the city of santa cruz and the county of santa cruz um and on the application we will have to delineate where participants um are throughout the county but it's unclear to me if um the county includes the the for five cities that are within the county, Capitola, Watsonville, um, what have you, the Scotts Valley and stuff. So, so um, there was a question that I thought got to it pretty well. It was like, in my current understanding, city of Santa Cruz dollars could be used to fund a program that's working out in Watsonville. Um, and it said there was no answer to the question at that time. So I guess, yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to pose this question. <laughs> like succinctly but it you know does does county fund one way to put it does county funding only apply to unincorporated um parts of the county and does city of santa cruz only apply to um you know uh participants that are living in the city of santa cruz alex i, kn I know you're um You've been an integral part of the HSD side of the team. Is that something that you want to address first and then Nicole and I can add our two cents or? Yeah, um, I guess I would say around the response um, that was given to that question, it's not that a response isn't coming, it's just that we haven't formulated one. And so we're hopeful to get that out as soon as possible to folks. Um, it's just taking a little bit of coordination um, with the city to make sure that the response is accurate. Um, so I guess in, in, in that realm, I think I would hold off personally for me to add anything else until we have that response from the city um, and the county together, which I know probably isn't the answer that you were hoping to receive, but it's that it's gonna be coming soon um, for sure. 
And is it fair to say, Alex, though, that the whatever the city versus county designation is, is one thing, but the other cities in the county, so Watsonville, Scotts Valley, Capitola, those are not excluded from county funding. Yeah, I think that's safe to say. Mm -hmm. I would just piggyback that I have a lot of questions about that. Um, so the more detail when they do come up with the answers, I think would be appreciated. Um, I'm, I'm wondering because I am in an unincorporated area, but now I hear that county funds will be used, which they should, but is there a designated amount that's just gonna be targeted to unincorporated areas? And then also for initiatives that are countywide, um, you know, will city funds be appropriately allocated toward those programs? because they are serving city residents, but they're also serving other residents. So will there be a commingling of funds, I guess? The, the, co the extent of commingling and how that's described, I think is what Alex is referring to as an answer that's forthcoming and being navigated. Um, I don't believe specific amounts are set aside for um, unincorporated areas versus other areas or any areas. So part of this whole issue as we discussed earlier is um, trying to see where applications land in terms of core conditions, geographic parts of the county, different populations addressed. So I think there was a, a real um, attempt to not be prescriptive out of the gate to not say you, you can only do X, Y, or Z or should apply this way or that way. And so the idea is that people will document needs and strengths and ways that they address the needs and play to their strengths and build on those. And then it's um, a question of where does all of that land as a totality? So I, I don't believe that, that there have been decisions about um, or pre-made decisions about percentages or allocations. And in, in fact, the opposite, a real attempt not to do that. Um, the difference with the city versus county funding is that those are different sources. And so, um, and I think there's openness to providing some latitude there, but it, the, the specifics of it still have to be um, delineated and acceptable to everybody before it's publicized. So I know that's um, not, not the ideal sequence of timing that that you know, might've been clearer before the RFP was released, but it, it's imminent, I believe. Is that fair to say, Alex? And I'm, I'm sorry if that's confusing or not, um, not providing guidance in a way that you'd hoped for, but I think um, as we discussed in a, a previous call about the small tier, figuring out what your program does well, the contribution you make, how you do that, what that's based on, why you think it'll work, um, all of that is, is unaffected by um, the the things we were we were just talking about the particular allocation which core condition you choose what part of the county you're in so what these sessions are about is we're, we're doing our best to answer your questions and we, we admit up front we don't have all the answers as we've just demonstrated but we want to help you develop your strongest proposal and case give you the concepts the tools the um, the links the resources that do that um, but if you have particular questions about the application itself, um, those are best directed to HSD. And so we, and Nicole and I are not part of the scoring or review process whatsoever. So we're not involved in that end of the um, RFP process. Kayla? I can't figure out how to do the digital hand. I'm a oh, oh, it's a reactions button. 
Oh, I can't. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there it is. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. All right. I wanted to, I wanted to wait until you were done. I apologize for jumping in like that. I just have another no, no. question. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, um, uh, is it possible? Um, so I understand um, any organization can submit however many applications they would like. I assume as long as it's like you know different programs and such. Um, but you cannot submit multiple applications across the tiers. Um, my my question, although that seems pretty clear, is is it possible to um, uh, apply as like a medium? Uh, grant and um, if we're invited to be a part of a targeted impact grant that's like zooming in on a specific thing that we do within a you know a collaborative um, framework can we do both or do we need to pick one or the other I think you can do both I think what what the multiple tiers restriction is trying to get at is not um, applying for the same thing in multiple ways so the same staff, the same outcomes. So if there are different, um, different strategies, different initiatives, are you saying your portion of a collaborative effort would be the same as what you would apply for in the medium tier? Or you yeah, I think what we're confused about, we plan, we're one of those organizations that you mentioned in the RFP that our whole organization is our program. We only have one program. Uh -huh. um, so we would be applying for that um, in a medium tier based on how many people we serve. Um, and it really depends on this county versus city um, articulation for us to know whether we're medium or small. Um, okay. so, so we're waiting on that to know which one to be in. Um, but, but aside from that, um, we were also invited to consider joining um, a group that's like kind of wanting to put forward a targeted impact uh -huh. um, grant as well. And we assume, you know, we only do one program, like I said. Oh, I see. So, yeah. So we're, we're trying to understand, do we do, do we do both or do we pick one or the other? And how would one, you know, what information is at our disposals to help us make that decision? Mm -hmm. um, Nicole, what do you think? Or Alex? I mean, that is a, a situation that technically might be the same program in different tiers, but um, I mean, when I, so I think that's probably a, a question to Pose to HSD again. And so, Kayla, if you don't mind, like, and I saw that you put that your question in the Google Doc, if you wouldn't mind just like copying and pasting that and sending it to that core funding at Santa Cruz County.us email, it'd be good to get that one like officially asked so it can be included in a future QA doc. Um, I think what we can do is, is look at the RFP together and kind of try to think together about the about how it's phrased in there and think about like what might be some ways to approach that or or, or think about that. Um, so like if I'm looking at, I can share my screen if it helps. Okay, so I'm looking at the RFP in the application parameters. So this is page six, although in the PDF it's page 10, um, about the application parameters. So let's see, city and county intend to find an entire proposal, da, 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 three key parameters, no limit to the number of applications. Agencies may not apply for the same program or project defined in the same way to more than one tier. And then you just have to make sure that your total request if you are submitting multiple applications or you're part of multiple applications, doesn't exceed that 25% of the total core funding available. Um, so, you know, I, I think the part of the challenging thing in terms of particularly like for like Nicole's my role because we're not gonna be involved in the scoring or, or trying to interpret this RFP, um, Again, kind of like with this, the last conversation, I'm not sure that we can give you <laughs> specifically the answer you're looking for. Um, but like, if we look at the way that's phrased here, same pro program or project defined in the same way, 
then like if I were an applicant, I'd, I'd think about, well, so would I be, and I think this is what Nicole's asking a moment ago, like would I be defining the program or project in the medium tier application in exactly the same way as what it would be, how it'd be described in the targeted impact proposal? And if so, that that could be, that might be problematic. That might be, that might raise, raise questions about, oh, wait a minute, here's this one proposal as a standalone, it looks exactly the same as this other piece of this other proposal that looks like it's a duplicate. Um, so you have, I think I saw also elsewhere in the RFP, like it's really up to you to decide how you want to define program or project for the purpose of this RFP. And so that sometimes happens where like organizationally, the way you're structured, right? You might, your organization and program might be one and the same in terms of your funding proposals or how that's structured. You might define your program or project in a different way. And it's, you know, so that it's, you can clearly say in a medium tier application, here's the program or project we're applying for. If it's also part of a targeted impact proposal that it's defined differently or it's described different, or it's clear that you're asking or proposing something different. Um, so I'm not, you know, again, that may not entirely um, address or solve what you're, what you're asking about, but I think at this point, that's probably, I'll have to wait to see what, what else HSD might say in response to that, but just purely looking at the RFP and kind of what's, what language is included in there. There are some places in there, right, where you have some flexibility or, to, or room to decide like how you're defining things. Thanks that for that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure others will have that question as well. Okay. Any other questions brewing for you that you either want to go ahead, Vanessa? Uh, hey, I also had a question that was addressed in the Q&A document, but I uh, would just wondering if I could just, um, you know, put in for a little more information that we're, um, we're looking for a little bit more information about what reporting requirements will be involved if we do get the contract. Um, I just know I'm working with some teachers who've been doing a research grant. So in order to continue their funding, they have to do a whole lot of extra work um, with research interviews. And I'm sure this won't be quite that much, but just, um, as I'm sure is the case with everyone right now, weighing out the bandwidth of what um, what everyone's able to take on um, at this point um, for reporting. So just if it's possible to get any more, you know, any future details about um, what the reporting will involve after the awarding, that would be great. Vanessa, I won't surprise you to know that came up in our earlier small tier um, conversations as well. And I did see that that, that was um, one of the responses in the Q&A of um, kind of in the stay tuned category. There will be reporting requirements, but it's not clear yet exactly what they will be. I know that from the, um, the conversations that we had with community partners and funders over the summer leading up to the RFP, the idea of simplifying wherever humanly possible um, was, a, was a loud and clear message. And um, we believe that was, that was received as well. So there's some, you know, some things that these are um, public funds. And so there has to be certain levels of accountability for, for them. Um, but within that, when, when there's discretion for streamlining, I think that's being taken into consideration. Um, frequency of reporting, extent of reporting, and the idea that the different reporting requirements will, will also, this hasn't been decided yet, but one of the suggestions was that, that for the smaller grants, smaller funding, there would be fewer reporting requirements than for the larger and more involved ones. So there's that kind of uh, difference as well in 
in the reporting requirements, potentially. So again, nothing's been decided yet, but those are the things that are in the mix. Alex, is, is there anything else to add there that would be helpful? No, I, um, I don't think I have anything else to add, but um, I will take it back and see maybe if we can get some clarification on, you know, at least the timing um, of what reporting can be, because I know it's helpful to be able to plan that in advance. So that would be great. And so just one of the, if, while you're taking that back, one of the things we heard this morning was, for example, for people who do uh, for organizations that do, might do something like a client satisfaction survey that happens once a year. So the reporting, you know, if, if there's reporting that's more frequent than that, then that's, there's not much else to say besides that. So um, that's good to know. That's Thank you. Yep. And, and a lot of it depends on how your outcomes are phrased and structured and, you know, what that's something to think about in planning as well, you know, what are the, what are the measures that you would collect for any reason? I mean, are there things that you might want to know internally, um, not just for reporting or things that, um, that become part of your own um, examination of what's working and why and how and where to fine tune things. And so to what extent can those things do double duty as reporting for funders and, um, that's all, all something to think about as well. Anything to add, Nicole? No? Okay. Good question. Thank you, Vanessa. And thanks for taking that back to HSD, Alex. Thanks. I think I will add something because I know that um, this was also kind of a lesson or a tip from the last core funding cycle as well, that um, sometimes there can be the temptation or that urge to feel like, well, I have to put in lots of outcomes or lots of things I'm going to measure to show that <laughs> we're doing a lot or that we're going to accomplish a lot. And, and if you look at the RFP and the applications, that's really um, encouraging streamlining. So like, you know, it's not necessarily saying like, tell us 10 outcomes you're going to measure, but like one or two, or I think targeted impact is, is three, in the three to five range, I think. So it's, um, so the application is encouraging you to be realistic about what's meaningful to measure, you know, what's feasible to measure, um, and then you know, really explain like how you'll do that or what kinds of outcomes you, you expect to be able to get. So that will help then, I think, set the stage for also realistic reporting. Thanks. Just looking that up, it's up to up to eight for targeted impact, and three for medium and five for large in terms of the outcomes. Up to, up to. Kayla, do you have another question? I I do, but I. Oh, um, taking up a lot of space. So is there anyone else that has a question? Okay. We got lots of questions over here on the farm. No, no, that's great. That's what we want. That's why we're here. Cool. Um, so this has to do, I remember last time um, y'all did a lot of work to run us through evidence, like the spectrum of evidence-basedness, I guess we'll call it. And um, uh, specific, this is kind of specific to our organization, but um, we've had a, a research study done on our specific organization that was peer reviewed. Um, we also did a, a, you know, an event with stakeholders across the county, including schools and all that, you know, all this stuff um, to, to share the findings. Um, it's not in a clearinghouse. It's not like, you know, in one of those like EBP clearinghouses though. So I'm kind of confused where that like where that sits on the spectrum of evidence basedness um, is does it have to be in the because I, I remember last time there was like it has to be in a clearinghouse to be considered um, that, I just want to make sure I'm remembering it right um, yeah. so any so, any guidance you have on that yep so first of all that sounds great and really interesting and um, would love to see that and also um, kudos for sharing the findings with your partners and the community at large, because that's stuff that sometimes uh, falters. So, um, so the continuum of evidence um, 
and results is actually the topic of a training next week. So we'll, we'll put that in the that link in the chat. But the short answer is no, it does not have to be in a clearinghouse. And the idea of a the idea of a continuum is just that, that there we tried to get away from levels and tiers and hierarchies. And this idea is that um, you decide, you, you have clarity about what what you already know about your program and what else you want to know and your level of confidence in what it's telling you, what the information is telling you. So we can always use more information. So there's just some kind of sweet spot of um, data that we can that we can reasonably collect and have confidence in versus um, having rigorous evaluation and outside reviews take over our lives and our work. So that's not necessarily benefiting anybody. So the idea of the continuum is, are you, what are you trying to discover and learn about your program and how are you using that information? So maybe for some programs, it might be that they're just a brand new idea, which is terrific. That's how they all start, right? And what do you need to know in order to, um, to continue it? So do you want to tweak it and fine tune it? Do you want to expand it from a pilot to three school districts? Do you want, what do you, what do you, doing next with your program. Some people might be very happy with where they are and they don't necessarily, they, they feel like it's working. They have information that it's working for the goals that they've set out and they don't have this ambition of becoming a clearinghouse EVP program. Totally fine. Then there are steps beyond that where you might feel like, you know, um, somebody in another county asked me about this and they would like to replicate it. But I'm going to I'm going to invest some resources in figuring out what is really um, the magic sauce of our program, what really works here and could work elsewhere, and what kinds of things are unique to it. So they're just at every point along this continuum, you are gathering more and different kinds of information, more layers of information, more of a comprehensive look at what you're doing, and it's not right or wrong. It's just more. And so the more information you have, the more confidence you have that what you're seeing is not a fluke or an outlier or just the, uh, a product of person A's charisma or this person's connection to that school, whatever it is. So it's all about the, the consistency, the depth, the insight that you get from your information. But there's nothing right or wrong about the amount of information. It's just, does it match where you think your program is? So um, I think what you have just described, Kayla, um, sounds really helpful. It sounds like you found it helpful and somebody took the time to, to get some peer review and to think about what they're looking at. And all you have to do in the application is describe that. So it'll ask you, what, what do you consider to be evidence that your program is headed in the right direction and working and is effective? So um, I hope that helps. Okay. And come to the training next week. <laughs> and that continuum is also a PDF um, on the um, results menu on data share. Um, and so if you want to just take a look at it, and, and that is, I will say that that is something that has really shifted from the first round of, of core funding. And uh, there's been a lot of work in response to feedback about uh, either misinterpreting some of the, um, the concepts behind that or not explaining it clearly enough. Or, I mean, there, there were um, applications that were funded for innovative approaches and that's kind of got lost in the shuffle. So. Not, not to rehash past history or, or, or all of that, but that's just an, an example of something where I think we've all learned more about how evidence um, and concepts of evidence can be useful in different ways and that we can do a better job of explaining it and, and making it applicable. So, okay, let's see, any other, first of all, Kayla, does, did that answer your question? Oh yes, thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Nicole, anything to add there? No, and I, and I think you said this, but just to reiterate that, you know, in the application, you'll be asked to identify what point on the continuum, like to identify a particular program practice that you're 
going to be implementing and then where that falls in the continuum. It's very possible that depending on what you're doing and what data you have or what data exists, you might feel like, well, we're not exactly in this <laughs> point on the continuum, not exactly in that one. So you just you know have to make your best judgment call about what where you think it fits. That's not going to be scored in any way like, ooh, if you're further along on the continuum, it gets more points. It's just purely descriptive. So the reviewers know, so that the county and city know. And then in other responses to narrative questions, that's where you'll be describing what data does exist or what data do you plan to gather and all of that kind of stuff. So then really focus on like the um, kind of completeness and, and clarity of those responses so that again, a reviewer fully understands, you know, that again, data you have, the story it tells, what you plan to collect uh, in addition to that. And yes, thanks for that reminder, Nicole, that those are separate, you know, pinpointing where you are and the, the clarity of where you are on the continuum is one piece. And then what, what you plan to do the same or differently in terms of data collection is the other piece. And so if you're, you may already have ideas about that, but if you are looking for ideas about ways to learn more about a program that are standard you know, for, uh, for different points on that continuum, that might help you, might prompt some, some ideas for you to consider. But it's not, it's not saying you have to do X number of focus groups or these kinds of surveys or that kind of case study. These are ideas associated with each point along the continuum. Okay. Other other questions? Sandy, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm wondering at this point what um, you were mentioning about the reviewers and the assessments. Like, what is are, are the reviewers going to have written assessments, and are the applicants going to be able to um, get a get the assessments from the reviewers? And is it going to be a like in terms of how the reviewers are evaluating? Is it like the same kind of scale as a certain points? And then the points, the points have meaning in terms of decisions around funding. Can you talk a little bit about that process. The, um, the scoring and review process is something that we're not involved in at all. Um, Nicole and I are not involved in it at all, but it is um, being developed and will have some of the elements that you mentioned. Um, and I don't know exactly what format the feedback is, is planned uh, Alex, do you know? I am not sure. Um, okay, so maybe we should add that that set of questions, Sandy, which are are good ones, um, to the HSD list. Would you would you be willing to pose that to the email address that that Nicole listed in the chat? We can list it again if you need it. Just core funding at santacruzcounty.us. Yeah, I, I, maybe if I can get to that, but I would appreciate because you guys are here, if you would do that. Um, I, I have unbelievable amounts of work, endless amounts of work. And if that's something you can do, okay. hey, consultants, do your stuff, right? So Sandy, just to make sure I'm capturing your question correctly. So is the question would be what feedback will be provided to applicants after the scoring process. Uh -huh. And then also are the score, are the, the, the number, the scores directly related to the degree and amount of funding? And how are they? If they are, how are they? Are the scores directly related to the amount of funding? Or if it's funded? Yes. And, I, got, yeah, and, and I think that's that's a good clarification that we are only adjusting um, the amount funded by 10%. Um, so I don't think it's going to like, I think in previous cycles, there's been, you know, where some things get funded fully and some things get funded half. Um, so I think it's more related to if it will be funded, um, not the amount that it will be funded at, if that makes sense. So 10% of the amount asked. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what that means. And so how how is that the nuance of that? I mean, in terms of the uh, the ask, because wouldn't the this now everybody's going to be asking, you know, that that kind of has a real influence in, in the parameters of the ask. And how do you determine the need and the and the amount? I'm curious if you guys have discussed that. 
I don't think that's something that I could comment on today. Um, and it's these are all such great questions and I'm trying to scribble them down as fast as I can. Um, it, I don't know if it's possible for you to chat some of them into the chat if that's simpler um, than the, the core funding. Um, but we may I may need to like revisit some of these questions with you just to make sure I'm capturing them correctly. All right. Well, while we're talking about this, just one other question. Um, so it, in terms of the like the reviewers assessments, is there a process in place if there's a question or a clarification question that needs to come up as the reviewers are taking a look at the applications? Is there a process for the reviewers to outreach to the to the applicant to get some clarification questions answered? Yeah, so my understanding of it is that for fairness purposes, we can't ask one applicant something without asking it of the rest of the applicants. So if that was to happen, it would have to be something that would be done with all applicants where we ask um, for more information on something. That's my understanding of it. So I guess that in terms of that process, what, what I mean, what's really interesting is that if there's an, like say the reviewers are making an assumption about the um, the services being offered or, or the analysis, they have no way of, of, of asking any clarification questions at all, essentially. That means it's not going to happen. So if there's a misunderstanding or if there's a misinterpretation, um, there's no way for the reviewers to, to, to get that clarified. And that may end up being um, impactful in terms of decision making. Yeah, and I'm wondering, Nicole, um, Leslie and Nicole Young, if you all have any suggestions of how to make sure that applicants can be really clear in their applications so that we don't even run into that issue um, from the first, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why we're offering all this TA, the, the yeah. training and the TA to kind of walk through some of the, you know, all the different tools to help yeah. um, kind of yeah. think through, okay, if the application is asking this in terms of what is the need, like yesterday mm -hmm. we did, a, you know, earlier this week, we did trainings mm -hmm. on theory of changes and, and logic models, like those help, you know, prepare those kinds of responses for applications. Mm -hmm. That's really what these group office hours are for. Like if you start working on an application, you're realizing, oh, wait, I'm not sure if mm -hmm. I'm, you know, if there are any gaps there or like, or people mm -hmm. would have to read too much between the lines to understand what I'm saying, like, or the one-on-one -on -one TA sessions. Um, the so we're trying to offer lots of different opportunities to kind of help provide that objective eye um, so that, you know, if there's something that feels like it's a really right. Uh, right. big question or a gap that we might be able to say, hey, Sandy, like, what about this? Or mm -hmm. help us understand this, what you mean by this, which could then help you go back and, you know, fine tune your responses. So, I mean, so you're saying that, that as part of, you, you'll actually can, you'll read our application if we ask you to and give us feedback to, if you're seeing something that needs to be more, you know, or clarified. Is that what you're saying? That there's a process? I, I would say like we're, cause we, we wouldn't have the capacity either to like read through people's whole proposals, but like if you have a specific question or area like okay I, here's what here's how i have drafted my outcomes um do they seem clear like if you know to someone who's not doing the work on a day-to-day -day basis like does that make sense and so we might actually come back with questions like so tell us what you mean by this or how are you going to measure that or so we'll ask kind of like a in like a coaching style um to help you then fine tune right. and shape and that being said, I would suggest a, a good practice for proposals um, for any funder in any situation is to ha have somebody who hasn't been immersed in it to try to read it for you and have just basic clarity kinds of things. This doesn't make sense to me. How does this fit together? Um, a proposal Nicole and I worked on over the summer, we drafted my father-in-law <laughs> to, to read it. And uh, we you know, some, somebody who just um, can do those, those really um, basic clarity questions of this doesn't make sense to me, or I don't think you've explained, I don't think you've answered the question they asked, or I don't think you've explained how, how this would work. Um, that can be really helpful um, to just have another pair of eyes. 
but we will do our best to answer specific questions. And as Nicole said, can't, can't really commit to reviewing everybody's applications. So just in terms of uh, like all the training that we're getting, I'm hoping that the um, reviewers are gonna get an in-depth, the level of in-depth training that we're getting because the, the expectations for, and, and I guess the other question I have is sort of, you know, who is deciding who are going to be the reviewers and what sort of trainings are they getting? Um, I imagine some of them maybe have experiences doing this and some do not in terms of evaluation. Uh, and that seems like, uh, you know, because clearly the, the level of support that we're getting as applicants, I would hope that the reviewers are gonna get the, the level of in-depth preparation for their process. Is that, is that something in the works? Yes. And so what sort of trainings at this point are, are, are you guys planning for the, for the, for the review? You know, the, the reviewers um, won't be convened until early next year. And so some of that's still in development, but they will receive training on the core framework. Um, there will be um, rubrics for, um, they will be very familiar with the application, with the, the differences in the tiers, um, different data sources. Um, I, I'm not designing the training, so I can't answer your specific question, but I know that that's an important element of preparing the reviewers and, and trying to have a fair review of all of the applications. And I would would love maybe um, also want to make sure there's space for other questions too. But Sandy, if you do have any ideas of trainings that you'd like reviewers to have, it would be great for us to start generating a list as well. Um, to not not to say that we will be able to provide all those trainings to those reviewers, but it can help us think through what that might look like. Right. 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 And then um, I don't know if I've asked this one yet or not, um, but in terms of there's a score sheet. There is a score sheet again this year. They're going to have a score sheet, right? Yeah. yeah. So maybe if I can just say something, because I know we've got a um, a little bit of time left, and I want to make sure others have gotten all their questions asked as well. Um, anything having to do with the scoring, reviewing, um, those are uh, like technical questions that actually we don't have the answers to today. And so if it's a question that you want to make sure the county addresses, like formally addresses in one of the Q&A documents at some point, it would actually be really helpful if you can at least put it in the chat so we can make sure the question is captured exactly the way that you're wanting it to be answered versus re relying on us to interpret it and then, uh, and then ask it. Um, so just know that that, the, that process is very much in development, developing the scoring rubrics, figuring out the process for recruiting the panel members, selecting them. We just don't know. We don't have, none of us have answers at this point. So is there gonna be a training with just a technical question Zoom meeting? I mean, it, it, that would be great. We're having so many opportunities here for this level to interface with you guys. And, you know, Alex, thank you for being here as well. But I imagine that there's probably other people, hopefully, but you're getting more help than you have to do it all yourself, that we would have a Zoom opportunity, maybe I suppose it would be like in, you know, in January or whatever, to, to actually have a chance to um, talk to the, the people who are doing this part of it and, and having dialogue on a Zoom meeting because this is a great concept. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the questions we're bringing you is clearly in another category. And it would be a really good thing once you kind of have gathered more info um, to actually do a Zoom meeting with the applicants. I really recommend doing that. Okay, thanks for the suggestion, that. Sandy. Um, That's not, there's nothing planned at this point for that in terms of all the, in terms of any of this yet. Yeah. There's nothing planned. There's the uh, a couple more posting dates for the questions and answers. So any, so I think really right. the main mechanism that the county is encouraging right. is send the questions just to make mm -hmm. sure they capture everything, right? Send all the questions right. by yeah. email so it can then be answered and shared with everybody right. in a yeah. PDF. But we can certainly bring up that suggestion about, you know. Yeah, maybe yeah and at a point where you feel like, you know, and I know you're, you're, it's, it's unfolding, you're, you know, there's sort of like you're making, you're making it as we're going along, mm -hmm. but there's a point where, you know, even you guys are gonna go, okay, we've got our timeline. We better know what we know at this point. Yeah. But close to that would be a really helpful 
to have, you know, because this has clearly been the model, you know, that's part of the whole core application process is the level of support and training that's happening like here. So that piece of it seems to fit in the flow of how this is all un unfolding. So I would really recommend that to include that. Um, and then ha Alex, have everybody, you know, have other people involved in this um, who who are who are taking a, quite a lot of responsibility, right, in making yeah. this. And then, then I think that could be a much. So more Sandy, we, we will definitely pass along that suggestion. Um, in our last few minutes here, were there any other questions anyone wanted to either add to the Google Doc or ask out loud? And we can also stand for few extra minutes um, if there were any burning questions that we didn't get to yet. Go ahead, Kayla. Um, if no one else does, this one is just out of curiosity. I don't think it's um, going to impact how you know we put forward our application or I imagine others. But, um, but I understand that we need to select one um, core con condition and impact area, which makes sense. And you all have acknowledged that they're all interconnected and you can talk more about how that, that plays out in your program. I'm wondering though, for the way that um, decisions are made about funding, if, um, if grants are selected based on, like you wanna have an even distribution of services along each condition and impact area. So like, you know, for instance, if there's 10 applications and nine apply for economy and one applies for health, you know, is that, or, you know, like, are you trying to get it about even across all uh, 10, is it? All 10 or does there, it matter? There are eight core conditions. Eight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, unless I've really missed something, <laughs> um, but we, um, so, so there was an explicit decision to not try to do that, to not say X percent to health, X percent to economy, X percent to education, because um, of the idea that they're interconnected. And so um, the idea is to let all of you determine where you see needs and responses to needs, and at least initially see where that lands. If the, dis if the situation you described unfolds, so they're 10 applications and nine of them are for one core condition. The next step would be to say, well, how many of those are primarily for that, that same core condition, but also apply to other ones? And just to see if there's some kind of baked in balance within that. But because they're all connected and they're connected through equity, the idea is that, um, that and there are enough, um, there's interest and applicants from all these different areas, different parts of the county, different ties to uh, different core conditions that we should at least see where they land first and not try to prescribe that up front. And we, we talk, mentioned this in the last office hour session that um, part of the process is there's a March update to the Board of Supervisors and the City Council just to give them a sense of here's how many applications came in, total amounts by core condition, total amounts in each tier. Um, and it's, you know, and if they're at that point, if it looks like something is wildly off or unbalanced, or it really will ultimately be up to the Board of Supervisors and the City Council to decide whether to give any direction about percentages or shifting or things like that. And so that's another one of those things where um, there was a reason why it was set up to be very open ended the way it is in the RFP. And then it's too soon to be able to say anything about, like, you know, what will happen when it comes down to the funding recommend recommendations. Okay. If there's anything else lingering, please feel free to either put something in the chat or into the Google Doc, or of course, uh, by email to us for the uh, core concepts and tools and to the county for things related specifically to reviewer or the application process. 
itself. And we will forward your questions that did fall into that category through, through Alex and directly to HSD. And they, they will likely show up on the next iteration of that Q&A document. And hopefully the things that are still pending will get resolved by then as well. And so thanks for bearing with us as we all um, try to get through this together and, um, and strengthen everyone's applications. And we've done enough of these today that I can't remember if I gave my speech of no proposal is ever truly wasted, even if it doesn't get funded. Hopefully it, it helps clarify your, your goals and ideas and that you can use them in different ways as well. So that's the idea behind these tools that they're not just for this RFP, but they're good for other purposes as well. And um, if this RFP were not happening, we might not be doing these all back to back, but we would still be using these tools and, and providing training about them. So thanks for joining us today. Come to the other trainings if you're able, and they are being recorded so that if you can't join live, you can still listen to them at your leisure. So thanks, everyone. Thank Good you. luck. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Nicole. It's good to see you all. Thank Best you. of luck. Bye. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>